I first got interested in AI when I was um, on the last year of my undergrad. Okay. And I, I saw a book in a bookstore called Artificial Intelligence, which happened to be uh, the first textbook ever written about it by Lainey Rich. It was, it was a small thing at the time. Okay. And I was very puzzled by that title. What could, what could AI possibly mean? So I bought the book and I read it. And it had the chapter uh, on machine learning. And, and I thought two things. One was that if you could make machine learning work, it would be an amazing thing. It would take over the world. Uh, because, you know, if you can get computers to learn to do things automatically, this is just, you know, a revolution in, in any field where you can apply it. At the same time, the state of machine learning was so primitive, so bad, that I thought it would be hard to make significant contributions. Okay. Right, as opposed to more mature fields like physics or biology, where, you know, it's they mature, so it's hard to make contributions. So I decided to get a PhD in machine learning. I researched at the time, there wasn't that machine learning was a completely unimportant field, even within AI. No one thought machine learning would, would ever amount to much. The top departments didn't even have machine learning faculty for the most part, so I didn't apply to them. Uh, there were only a few places that had substantial machine learning groups. UC Irvine was one of them, and that's where I got my PhD. And, and uh, this was in the mid '90s. And halfway through, uh, you know, my grad time in grad school was when the first data mining boom happened. Okay. Suddenly, this idea of companies mining their databases for insights and whatnot was all the rage, and everybody wanted to have, you know. Um, a data mining lab or data mining group and, and, and classmates of mine had that got no job offers the previous year were like flying left and right and the funny thing is that this was over 20 years ago and it's been growing exponentially ever since every new phase makes the old one look small Getting. so we're now four or five steps into this and of course at some point it has to saturate but but it probably hasn't yet In terms of who, whose research I was interested in, one of the things that I did when I decided to get a PhD in machine learning was uh, make a list of potential advisors. Mm -hmm. And um, the top of that list was Jeff Hinton. Okay. Um, who, who was initially at, at CMU, but then I discovered he'd moved to Toronto, which made things kind of uh, more difficult and, and less desirable. Uh, but you know, uh, he, he could have been a great advisor. Uh, another one was Tom Mitchell. Mm -hmm. Tom Mitchell is the guy who started, he was one of the pioneers, uh, you know, he, uh, and he started the machine learning department at, a whole department of machine learning at Carnegie Mellon. So the book is a, an introduction to machine learning for a general audience. Mm -hmm. And I thought of writing such a book back in the 90s with the first data mining explosion. Yeah. because obviously things were at a point where people outside of the field would benefit from knowing about it. Mm -hmm. But at the time it didn't seem very urgent and I also did not have a very good idea for how to write such a book. Because a popular science book, unlike a textbook, can't just be a list of topics because people will fall asleep reading it, right? A textbook has a captive audience. If you don't study, you don't pass the exam and you fail the course. Yes. A book for a general audience has to be interesting on every page. And, and they, so a, a popular science book, like like a lot of, like all popular, you know, books, fiction or non-fiction really, has to have a story. And I, and I didn't know at the time what that story would be. Two things persuaded me to write the book in 2012, which is when, when I finally started doing it. One was that there was this explosion, you know, with the big data, uh, you know, uh, data science, et cetera. And, and I thought, the explosion got to the point where, you know, you saw a stream of, you know, front page stories in newspapers and, 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 and cover stories in magazines and whatnot. And so, you know, machine learning was not at the level where CEOs and presidents and whatnot had to think about it. Okay. So it was that important. It is that important. And, at the, you know, and it's at the point where like it touches everybody's lives and things that you do every day. So like, I really felt that now everybody really, you know, needs to know something about this. At the same time, there was such a lack of knowledge about it and so many needless, very costly mistakes being made that, that I was like, you know, somebody really needs to write this. So the sense of urgency was there. Mm -hmm. The other thing that was there was that I, I, I had an idea on, mm -hmm. on, on, on the story 
to organize the book around. So mm -hmm. I cast the book as machine learning being the search for the master algorithm. And then what I do is I take people on a tour of the different approaches, the different tribes, as I call them, different schools of thought in machine learning, mm -hmm. always with this idea that each one of them has only a piece of the puzzle. Mm -hmm. okay. But what we really need is to, is to find the whole. Right. We need to find a unified theory of machine learning, like there's the standard model in physics or mm -hmm. the central dogma in biology. And that's how we will solve AI. So I, I built the book around this, this idea, which, by the way, I still believe in, and, and we've made uh, quite a bit of progress on since. I don't align with any single one of them, which is unusual. Most people belong to one or another. Mm -hmm. But that was also part of what made me want to write the book and made me feel like I might be a good choice of someone to write the book, is that a lot of people who teach machine learning, they teach their paradigm as if it's the only one. Okay. And then people go into industry and all they have is a hammer, so then they pound you know, uh, screws into walls, not realizing that there's such a thing as a screwdriver. Yeah. So my PhD thesis was actually on unifying two of these paradigms and, ever, and since then, I've done further work on unifying them. So I've always felt from the beginning that you need to combine the ideas from each of these paradigms to really have a truly general purpose learning algorithm. And I think that is, that is more, more apparent. Now, I think what is happening with AI in terms of governance and ethics today and whatnot, I actually find not surprising on the one hand, but quite worrisome on the other. What I see is, and you know, getting back to why I wrote the book, is a lot of people who do not understand AI very well uh, trying to make big decisions about it, like passing laws and regulations about what you should do with AI. And a lot of these are very misguided. They're, they're written or created by people who don't understand the technology. They have misconceptions about it. And then what they do is they do harm. They prevent AI from doing things that it could, or they impose things on it that they sh that they shouldn't, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And and now, uh, for example, the European Union, as part of its general data protection uh, regulation, Europe is always very happy, you know, very trigger happy about piling on the regulations. <laughs> America is a little is a little more sensible in that way. But they have a legal requirement that an algorithm that makes decisions about you know human things like whatever medical diagnosis or credit or whatever, must be able to explain its decisions, right? Now, think about it for a second. We understand why this is a desirable thing, right? But what this seems to ignore is that there's a trade-off between explainability and accuracy. Okay. The most accurate models, because they're more complex, are typically the less explainable ones. Let me give you an analogy. Uh, trying to regulate, regulating AI, AI is a fundamental technology widely applicable for, for radically different things, right? Mm -hmm. So trying to regulate AI to me as such is like trying to regulate mechanical engineering. We need to regulate mechanical engineering. What is the ethics of mechanical engineering? This makes no sense. Mm -hmm. There are specific applications of, machine, of mechanical engineering that, that have ethics involved and that need regulated, and it's the same thing with AI. So for example, there's a lot of regulations regarding cars, right? Because they're very useful, but also very dangerous, right? They could kill someone. There are rules of the road, there's all of that, right? And the same thing will have to happen for self-driving cars, right? Okay. So regulations for self-driving cars, making societal decisions about self-driving cars, that's important, right? We, we have to have those if we have self-driving cars. Making regulations and ethical decisions about AI is just, I think, um, there's too much nonsense and too much opportunity for, for vacuous or harmful things that, than, than there is. I mean, like, for example, there's attempts to, to have ethical decisions by the program committee of AI conferences about, you know, every, pay, like, you know, you know, in Europe, right, is, is, the, is the largest AI conference in the world. Yeah. There's this ethics board now that reviews your paper and might reject it if it feels that the research is unethical and you have to have a section in your paper, of, you know, your paper could be about speeding up an algorithm mm -hmm. and you have to have a discussion of the ethical consequences of making an algorithm faster. This makes no sense. Okay. But, so it's not that ethics is not important, is that we are framing things the wrong way when we talk about the ethics of AI, you know, as, as a general purpose technology. 
And also, again, I think we are very early in the game. Mm -hmm. We don't understand AI yet to make good ethical decisions about it. So my view of, of regulating AI is you shouldn't regulate AI as such. There are specific applications that need regulated as such. But I think our best approach, social media, for example, is, is a great, you know, is a great example, right? Like mm -hmm. these AI algorithms are deciding what you see on Twitter and Facebook and what and what should we subject them to. And I think there's a few good ideas on how to do that. There's a vast mass of bad ones. Mm -hmm. I think for the most part, our approach should be more the American than the European one, which is wait and see. Okay. Let's see how things unfold. Mm -hmm. Let's let's try to figure out, you know, it's good to have a dialogue about these things, but let's not jump the gun, right? Like trying to regulate something before you understand it is, is generally not a good idea. I think AGI is a is an achievable goal, and it's a good goal to try to achieve. My goal is to achieve AGI. Okay. Uh, what? But um, to answer that question, really, you really have to first, you know, decide what you really mean by AGI. Right? In the beginning, in the first 50 years of AI, nobody talked about AGI because AI was AGI. Right? AI. So AG. What? What is AGI? Right? AGI is artificial general intelligence, and intelligence by definition is general. If it's not general, it's not intelligence. Okay. The, the need to call something a GI came from as the AI became more mature, you got into a lot of these specialized subfields that do very narrow things like classifiers, for example, you know, to take a machine learning example, or planning algorithms or parsers or whatever. And people got frustrated that this didn't seem to be taking us closer to the, the, the goal of human level intelligence. And when I think of AGI, I, I think more of like human-like or human-level intelligence. We can have forms of intelligence that are very different from human. Okay. But I think having intelligence that is at the level of a human being is the challenge that has defined AI from the beginning mm -hmm. and continues to be. And I think, again, it's a great goal to have because if you can have uh, intelligence in machines at that level, that means that intelligence is now extremely cheap as opposed to extremely expensive. And, and now you can do all sorts of things with it that you couldn't before. Mm -hmm. It is at the same time, just to modulate what I said, mm -hmm. achieving you know human level intelligence is by far the hardest problem that we have ever tried to solve. Right. And I think the problem with a lot of people in AI and AGI in particular is that they really don't quite get just how hard the problem is. Okay. It's like, you know, it's, you know, it's like we're on a road to, you know, human level intelligence. And, you know, we've come a long way. We've come a thousand miles, right? In the first, you know, 60, 70 years, but there's a million miles more to go. So it's a, it's a worthy goal, it's achievable, but it's, you know, we got, it's a very tall mountain to climb. I'm doing research uh, in a number of directions. Okay. Um, one of them is, um, on something called tensor logic, which combines um, symbolic AI with uh, uh, with deep networks, okay. which is these days a very very popular topic. But I think tensor logic is is a, is a much better answer to this than uh, the people have uh, come up with before. Uh, so I have very high hopes for it. And um, uh, again, it's you know part of the same uh, agenda that I described earlier. I'm also doing work on a, a completely new paradigm. So mm -hmm. I was saying there have been no new machine learning paradigms since the beginning. I think maybe, or I think more likely, even if we successfully unify the, the existing five, that's not going to be the answer. Mm -hmm. I think we're going to need some fundamental new ideas. And I'm working on some of those, uh, uh, one of which is called symmetry-based learning, which mm -hmm. is machine learning based on ideas from symmetry group theory, which are fundamental in mathematics and physics, for example, but uh, you know, are only starting to make a, a, a contact with AI. In the last few years, this has grown, but I think it's still only a small part of what it can be. Um, but outside of that, I'm also writing, you know, a, a, another book. It's a novel this time. It's not a, it's not a, um, a, a popular science book. It's a satire of the tech industry. Okay. Um, again, that's that's I think a fun thing to do, and also uh, I think that there's a real need for something like that right now.